Hello, hello. Ron Callis here to bring you another episode of Automation Unplugged. Today is Wednesday, September 9th. It is uh, 12.30, a little bit after 12.30 p.m. Eastern time here in, in Florida. And uh, it's been a, a rainy day, as you can see out the window here. It's, you can actually see a little bit of the golf course out there. It's been nice and rainy and storming all morning. And uh, we are here for episode 136. So as I always do, let me go ahead and jump over to Facebook. Let's see if this is uh, effectively streaming in. Let's see if the technology gods are behaving. So uh, bear with me here as I try to look at that. Oh, let's see. But you know, I'm on the wrong screen. There we go. All right, let's see if I see it. There we go. I do see it. Looks like we got an audience forming. Thank you, guys. Thank you, gals. If you are out there, don't forget to maybe drop a comment. Let me know where you're coming to us from. I'll put it on the screen and read it out loud. It's always fun to see where our viewers uh, and or listeners are coming to us from. And today, I have uh, the pleasure to bring you... Uh, Longtime friend of mine and industry veteran, uh, Josh Willits. He's president at Portal. You guys may know this as know them as Portal.io. They are the proposal software company, and uh, we're going to talk all things Portal. And uh, we're also going to have a lot of fun digging back into a lot of. Josh's past and uh, Josh and I have actually intersected on a number of different occasions over the last 20 years. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll also talk about some of the, uh, the changes that portal has made to their business model. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the things they've learned as they've gone through this 2020 year of COVID and kind of their very interesting vantage point that they have uh, really looking at that front end proposal, uh, which you could call the tip of the spear for trends that are happening uh, through the, throughout the industry. So we're going to dig into all of that. So without further ado, let me go ahead and bring in uh, Mr. Josh. So he should see a countdown now. Josh, there you are. Hey, Ron. How's it going, man? It's going good. It's going great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, it's been a while. I know we uh, we've talked about doing this, so I'm excited to be on. As uh, you know, you run a busy schedule, and there's we all have a lot going on. So I'm glad we were able to cross paths and and make this happen. Let's first of all start with family. How you know there's this virus running around? How's family, and and then how's uh, everyone at Portal doing? Uh, they're doing good. My uh, kids I have two girls. Um, seven and 12, uh, seven, almost eight. And, uh, they went back to school today actually. So we sent them off. I had the house to myself, which was the first time since March, um, generally. <laughs> and so, uh, that was good. Everybody at portal is doing well, working hard and, um, yeah. So things now, are were you guys, were, was the portal team already virtual? I, I don't know. Were you guys a virtual company before this happened or was, did that happen after COVID? We are a hundred percent virtual. We started virtual. So okay. um, I've been virtual since 2008 um, when my oldest was born. So um, it's, it's, you know, as far as virtual goes, it's really business as usual for us, for our whole team. Yeah. It's it, same here at one firefly. We, uh, we weren't always virtual. Uh, no, I we, was at your office a long, was, long time ago. I was going to say many, many moons ago. I think you visited us in our, our yep. office there in downtown Hollywood. Yep. Um, but yeah, we, we made the move in 2015. Uh, we heard a rumor that in 2020, the world was going to shut down oh, and, yeah. and working from home would be the hip thing to do. Yeah. So yeah. We, we just made the move five years early. You're always ahead of the curve, Ron. Ahead of, well, not always, sometimes to a <laughs> fault. So, uh, and where is home for you? Like what city and state are you in? I'm in Mechanicsburg, uh, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Harrisburg and Hershey. 
Okay. And for those that are listening that don't know what portal is, I'm speaking a foreign language. They're like, Ron, what is this portal thing you speak of? What What is portal? And then what is your role within portal? Yeah. So portal is a proposal tool specifically built for dealers in the, in the CI CD, a channel. Um, I'm the president, so I'm mostly responsible for um, our revenue channels, customer service team. M most things dealer facing really falls under my my umbrella. So, okay. And uh, Kirk Chisholm is the founder and CEO. Mm -hmm. And how does, uh, if you don't mind, like how, for example, what do you do in the business, or what are you doing day to day versus for those that may have heard of Kirk or have run into him versus his roles within the company? Right. So I primarily work on everything dealer facing. So uh, dealer support team, you'll see me jump into the chat and helping dealers live. Um, our engagement team, which works to onboard dealers and do demos. Um, I also do demos with, with dealers every now and then. Um, I work with the suppliers and the vendors to uh, as they interact with our data team. Uh, to keep their data up to date. Um, and then uh, those are really where I spend most of my time. I also cross over a little bit into development, help the developers uh, in terms of um, QA, QC and uh, testing and things like that. And then um, Kirk helps uh, with the, he owns the roadmap basically. Um, he's a great designer um, in terms of the look and the feel of the site and how it should function, what dealers want and need, uh, and then managing that roadmap of the features that we're going to build out. Um, also design um, falls under his umbrella and then all the administrative stuff that nobody likes to do. He, he gets his hands dirty and he's willing it. to take on. Yep. Awesome. So I, I want to learn about all the, the things that you're doing over there at portal. I'm hearing all sorts of good things. I know you're growing and you're, you're bringing on new customers every month. Uh, but before I go there, I always love to learn about you and your background and how you actually landed where you're at. Cause I know you've, you've done a lot of, you've had some different roles in this industry. Uh, so do you mind taking us, taking us in the way, way back machine? Yeah. So I think the way, way back, well, it depends on how far back you want to go. <laughs> I, well, we could go to like, birth or we could just go to high school. Right. I don't know. You, you could tell us where you want to start. <laughs> um, I really got into electronics when I was a kid. So I used to ride my bike to Radio Shack and get those little motors and then build cars out of Lego kits and stuff like that. So I liked tinkering and electronics. So that put me on the path to going to college for electrical engineering. Um, and so when I was in college, I got interested in speakers and AV gear. And that was when UBID was big and eBay um, had, had just really started up. I think um, uh, PayPal was just starting to link into, into eBay. And so I ended up from my dorm room buying speakers on UBID and then reselling them on, on eBay. And I started to do a little business there. And we also... Uh, in my, my dorm room, we connected a, you know, 5.1 surround sound system to an old Kenwood surround receiver. And this, and that was just, you know, that wasn't really industry stuff. That was just me figuring out. You uh, being my, the coolest kid in the dorm right. hall. Is that what that was? <laughs> my senior year, I think my roommate and I had two receivers connected together with 10 speakers total, plus a subwoofer. And, um, I ended up with these like club jbl or sorry jensen speakers um that sat on the floor you couldn't like they were bookshelves like literally bookshelves you could put a whole bunch of books on top of them uh -huh. um and so that system could really kick <laughs> we weren't Was really that allowed in the dorm or did yeah you we miss? never yeah. we never really got in trouble but we weren't really doing critical listening in there either we were just <laughs> We were just trying to get it loud and uh, and enjoy movies. And so, you know, that kind of started for me in college. Um, and uh, so, but I got my degree then in electrical engineering and my first job out of college was at an engineering firm. So uh, commercial MEP firm actually here in Harrisburg. And I did, I knew that I liked, you know, I had a lot of friends that were doing, um, you know, board level design, chip design, stuff like that. Um, I liked system design. So I was in the telecommunications department of a, of a engineering firm. And so we did um, security and uh, telco stuff. Did you have to wear a suit to work every day? 
Uh, I had to wear khakis and a button down shirt. That was yeah? my, okay. that was my f- first foray into the corporate world. And it only lasted about two years. <laughs> okay. And so I liked it. The part I liked the most was the AV design. So I really wanted to focus in on that, but we didn't have a ton of, of business that was, that was AV design. And so, um, and also the corporate environment just wasn't a good fit for me. Um, you know, the expectation that you, you stay late just for the point of staying late and not because you actually got your work done or didn't get your work done, it was stuff like that. Um, although I did take one thing away from, from my boss at, uh, at the engineering firm, I remember, and I still tell people this to this day, he told me I didn't, you know, we were talking about something that we were learning or um, something that I knew or didn't know. He said, I, I didn't hire you because of what you learned in college. I hired you because in college you learned how to learn. And so that was something that I sort of always took with me um, that it's okay to not know everything. um, Just be open to learning. Um, And so Yeah. After two years, I got introduced from a friend of a friend to an integrator here in uh, Mechanicsburg, World Premier and uh, and Ken Bosley. And so um, sat down with them and those guys were doing, I want to say we're around 1.5 million or so a year um, approaching two. And they were, they had a sales team that was pretty well established. It was the owner and a, and a really talented um, salesperson that was focused hundred percent on sales. Um, and they had an install team, but they hadn't taken that next step to hiring somebody to sort of manage uh, the back office and operations and make sure everything was efficient as it could be um, manage the schedule with the text and all of that stuff. So they were looking for an operations manager and, I was 24 year old kid at who was probably too ambitious for his own good <laughs> coming I'll out say, of an engineering did, firm. <laughs> how did that happen? Because I mean, you don't I, see many integrators hiring engineering graduates out of college and then yeah, to I, a new role. It was, it was this, like, I love what you guys are doing and do you have a place for me there? And I think they sat down and said, what's our biggest need? Well, it's on the engineering or, or the, um, you know, system design. That was the the link. Like this guy can do system design. We were moving from, at the time, we we're moving from Elan to, to Crestron. So mm-hmm. system design was becoming more and more important. And, um, but also like, what else would this person do? Because, you know, it's a small company, so they have to justify the the cost. And so, um, it really came down to sort of running operations. So I grabbed the first 90 days book, um, which was probably from, you know, the early two thousands and I read it and I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go. <laughs> so um, they actually had a first 90 days book. Yeah. For it's onboarding like, it's on my shelf somewhere. It's like, what do you do? What's an executive doing the first 90 days? So I read it and I'm like, all right, uh, let's do it. So I had went to the interview with a ton of notes just about like how their business works and stuff like that. And, um, I showed up on my first day and they were like, Ken was like, all right, be an operations manager. Go do it. (laughs) That's, that was like the first morning. So I grabbed a, um, a legal pad and a pen and just followed people around and said, okay, what do you do here? What do you do this? Like, how does this work? Um, where's the schedule? How do people get scheduled? And I just, for like a week or two, I just asked people questions and, and wrote everything down and, and just sort of put myself into the business wherever there was a need, you know, this, this part's not working well. Can you help fix this? Or the, you know, the, the guys are running parts, running out of parts on the job site. Well, okay. Run them apart and then figure out how to, that doesn't happen again, that sort of thing. So, um, that was my, my introduction to the custom integration business. Um, and I was there for close to five years. Um, and I wore every hat. I learned so much, um, on that job. I wore just about every hat that, that you can wear. Um, I started off as operations manager. Um, we ended up doing an implementation of NetSuite for our, um, software and, and moved off of QuickBooks. And so I ended up. How did that go? The the NetSuite actually, they might be watching. I I constantly am getting (laughs) emailed by NetSuite. Sales reps. This was, I think, right before they got acquired by um, Oracle. So okay, this was when they were 
they were pretty young still. And we were looking for something that was, um, that could run our, our whole business on. And uh, I think we had an install of D tools, but at the time, uh, we had, we had hired an engineer at that point. This was a couple years in, and, um, he was really the only one that worked in D tools and it was just for the drawing side. And then, um, what we did was, uh, NetSuite was good. I mean, it worked for us, but it, it only worked because we were a certain size. Um, okay. Once once 2008 hit and, and people, you know, we started to feel feel it a little bit and people started to leave, um, then it just became too much for, for what we needed. Um, but, you know, getting the buy-in from everybody was a challenge because it only works when everything goes the right way. But that was my job for probably three months. We brought in a... Um, uh, Utz Baldwin actually had NetSuite at his company in Texas. And mm. so we reached out to Utz and got his consultant, NetSuite consultant, and brought them in to help us. Um, I designed the company workflow um, from start to finish for projects and service. And oh, wow. she ended up buying it back from us so she could use um, for other integrators who wanted to do NetSuite uh, implementations. Um, so we just, we designed that out and then we built books on how you do this and how you do that. And then we automated the transition. So we, we keyed in on the transition points in the business. So we looked at, okay, when does it go from sales into the next, you know, into admin? And then what does that look like? And so when sa sales would close a job, then immediately an email would be generated that would go to the admin person that would say, okay, it's, it's on your plate now. These are your five steps, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, we did that in probably 2006 ish. Um, and then what happened in 08 when, you know, the global meltdown. Oh, we, we actually had a, so we had a high end company, which was world premiere was the name of it. And um, we did some really high end theaters with acoustic innovations um, and we were doing theater and, and Crestron work. We had a couple of big Crestron jobs that we were doing. And this is not a huge market. So, um, we were one of the only Crestron dealers around here. And then we, um, and then we started, a, a sister company to bring packaged, uh, surround sound systems into, um, you know, mid-market homes. And so it was a, a sister store that we ran with our own staff and um, we only sold home theater packages, TVs. Like a brick and mortar retail type Brick and store? mortar retail packaged. It You walk in and it was like, um, here's your surround sound system package. Starts at two grand installed. And then we have a $3,000 package and a $5,000 package. And then you pick your TV and the install package, which includes your remote is a thousand bucks. And so we made it really easy for people and everything was included. So we weren't doing these custom bids and that sort of thing. So, um, and that did okay. I think that was a little before um, it's time. And plus it was like right when the market crashed. So um, that was challenging for a while. I ran that store. So it was like um, Ken and, and the partner at the time got it, got it up and running. And then um, we had a need to go in there and work on that. At some point during world premiere, I was the, I got CDS certified to train architects. So for about six months, I was meeting and, and giving, you know, uh, credits to architects for doing lunch and learns and, and that sort of thing. So like I said, I wore a lot of different hats, but we had this sister store and actually that's the sister store was called genius home theater. And that is how I got introduced to um, Jay down at snap. Um, because, uh, we found out about them when they were selling plasma pop-up furniture, which was the first product that they sold in these, and these cabinet cinema walls that you would put a projector screen in, and then you could, you'd have this sort of cabinetry. And that was the first pieces that they sold. So Ken and I jumped in a car, um, and their sister store, they actually came out of a company called Zobo TV. Uh, for those in North Carolina, they probably all have heard of Zobo. They had about three locations. They were pretty much all beside a tweeter store. And so, but they were selling things in packages similar to what we were doing. So we were like, let's go down and check it out. And so we drove down and got a tour from Jay of Zobo. And he's like, Oh, I got this other cool thing that I'm doing now. It's called snap. And it's, and, and this is what we're doing. And like, we're going to do speakers soon. Do you want to order the first speakers? And that sort of wow, thing. You were right there at the beginning. Yeah, this was before they hired Adam. And so um, that was, or maybe right when they they hired Adam. And so 
Um, Jay was really excited about what we, they were doing and we ended up selling some of their speakers in our packages up um, in Genius. And so that was that time frame. It was probably 2005, six, seven uh, when we were doing that. And then, you know, the market crashed, we ended up uh, shutting down Genius, moving everything back into, into World Premiere, uh, which continued. So they're still going pretty strong today. Um, and so, uh, and Ken's still a good friend. Um, I was just talking with him uh, a week or two ago. So, so we keep in touch, but uh, it got to the point where he had to scale back the business. Didn't need anything that I was working on at the time. Um, I was working with the architects uh, and designers, but that business wasn't really ramping up because the building business was, was dying. So um, it was time for me to move on. And that's when I went to, uh, to Jetson Systems. And that's when I met you. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah so tell, tell everyone who, who and what Jetsons was. <laughs> so Jetson Systems was a crash, primarily Crestron programming firm. We did some AMX as well. We had some guys trained in AMX. Um, and then a little bit in Savant. Uh, I actually got trained in Savant um, when Savant launched. And, uh, but mostly Crestron. So we were outsourced Crestron programming um, and system to design. So they're based in San Francisco. I telecommuted. So that's when I said I've been telecommuting since working from home since 2008. When I started with Jetson, we had a, a, a couple projects on the East Coast, but I had to drive to them. We did the uh, Comcast headquarters in, in Philly, uh, which was a cool project. Uh, a couple big residences outside of Washington, D.C. We had an integrator down there that we worked with. Um, and so I did a lot of the QC uh, on those projects. Make, after the programmer was done, I would come in and make sure everything worked to spec. Um, I helped develop the specs for every job, um, the requirements, documents that went into every job. So they knew what we were delivering with the programming. And there weren't any, hey, I thought it was going to work this way or that way at the end. Um, and so I did that for a couple years. Um, that's when I met you, I think just through the industry and I was with, uh, Jetson at the time and, uh, that went great. And then Jetson got acquired by, um, engineered environments. Uh, and so I worked for engineered and, and Randy Stearns who now runs Detools. Um, so I worked remotely. Um, I ran their, um, programming and, and design team remotely. And so um, we were there, we had a couple really big projects, which uh, at the time, because of those big projects, it made sense for Randy to acquire the business and, and uh, the former owner had moved on to something else. And so I did that for, I don't know, about, um, I would say a year to 18 months before Randy spun it off to our biggest client at the time, who was a private equity company. Um, he was American, but he's based in, um, in Europe. And we basically became their technology division. Um, and I actually reunited with the original founder of Jetson Systems there. And so we had a team of developers, we had the intellectual property, and then we just standardized on, on Crestron for control across all the properties. We built a lot of the racks in, uh, in Alameda in partnership with uh, Engineered Environments. We would ship them to different job sites around the world. So we were on Long Island, um, in Florida, and then uh, projects in Amsterdam. Sounds like very complicated and, logistics. Yes, it was. And shipping three full size racks is not not. I say, how do you do that without? How do you ship a, a three full size racks across the world without uh, them falling apart or the it liability? It was pretty intense. Some of them did fall apart a little bit, but okay. we made it work. <laughs> okay. There were some, there were some bent rack rails by the time they got to London, but, um, we made it work. Okay. So, um, so yeah, we were, we had properties all over and it was, it was really fun. It was a great opportunity to, um, to just, you know, own the technology in these houses and standardize. And we had, uh, connected, uh, it systems on Cisco backbone. So they were, everything was all connected together. Um, we were putting a uh, VoIP Cisco VoIP in, um, around the time that I left. And so, you know, we just, it was our job to own the technology and make sure it worked whenever somebody showed up to the site. We, we had some really amazing properties in Colorado, um, in a ski town, Crested Butte, um, 
And then there were a couple projects. When I left, there were some in the works that people were like, why did you leave? <laughs> and, um, you know, I loved doing it and it was, it was a great, it was great work. It was cutting edge. Um, we were doing some really cool things. We were tying in oxygen delivery sensors in, um, in Crested Butte in a ski lodge and tying it into alarm, um, uh, like, um, you know, like an alarm that you'd set to wake up in the morning on the, on the, like you'd pump the room full of oxygen to wake up. Yeah. So one of the things is That's crazy. Uh, when, you're at, when you're at high altitude, serving oxygen in the room helps your brain wake up from sleep state. So we would, we, we they had oxygen delivery ports in the rooms and we tied in, we figured out how to control them and tied them into an alarm app that we built on the Crestron panel. So they would, they would say, okay, I'm going to wake up at 8 a.m. And then like 7.30, we'd start delivering oxygen, pure oxygen. In Is this a normal before. thing at like nice resorts? Like, no, I didn't know. Like, where, where do you go to get oxygen pumped into your room to help you wake up? I, I didn't. I uh, To make that work, we had to have a special design, uh, a circuit design from Crestron. And, and actually, that's my fun um, George Feldstein story with Crestron because – I was at Cedia and we were just in the phase of design where we were trying to figure out how to control these things. And they didn't have the part that I needed coming out of the, um, no amount of oxygen can wait. Yeah. Right. I was we were told back then. I don't know if the science was sound or not. <laughs> I got, uh, uh, wait a nice. second here. I, I was trying to, let's see here. There's a, there's a funny <laughs> comment here. Uh, show. Well, I don't know that I'm seeing it. Let's see here. I was going to see Ted, Ted Russo said Colorado reporting. No amount of oxygen can wake me. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate that. <laughs> so, some reason my little uh, buttons here aren't giving me that on the screen, but uh, I appreciate that comment. And while we're at it, Wes, thanks for commenting. And on hell, thanks for commenting. Yeah. Hey, Wes. Hey, on hell. So he was George Felstein was up on the restaurant stage at Cedia. And he was like, if we don't make a part for something, or if we don't do something, you can come talk to me and I'll figure it out with you. And so he stepped down off the stage and I was like, walked right up to him. And I said, Hey, I'm Josh. I work for Jetson systems. We have this thing that, you know, I want to use this one part on, but it doesn't quite work and I need some help. And, um, he was like, okay, pulled out his business card. The only thing on it was this email address. And he's like, this is my email. It doesn't go to my assistant. It goes to me. I see every email. Send me an email and we'll figure it out. And so I was like, all right. So I sent him an email. He put me in touch with the engineering manager. They had a circuit design back to me uh, within the week. And we ended up putting it together and implementing it to control the oxygen sensors. So, Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's one and only George Feldstein. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so that's what we did. And when I went to, so this was in 2012 ish probably. And so I got certified on Savant. That was, um, we had to pull some strings to get trained in it because they weren't really allowing programming firms to, they had a brick Savant. wall. I, I know. Yeah. I remember I tried to get my firm certified and they yeah. would not allow us in, in, into the house. They closed it down pretty early. We were one of the first that got, that got trained on. I, I walked through the Savant factory when they were, I think I'm allowed to say this. They were, <laughs> they were, um, they took Mac minis and they set them back down into the, uh, chassis and they locked it in place and they slid the back cover over it. So the port stuck out the back. It was literally a Mac mini in the black box. Oh, that's hilarious. And so, <laughs> um, yeah. And that was, yeah. So that was, I don't know, 2012 ish, probably 2011 maybe. And, um, so I got trained on Savant and I was sitting around, we went to dinner with a bunch of integrators who a couple of them I'm still in touch with now. And they were all like, um, they were all talking about products that they had sitting in the warehouse. And the one guy was like, oh, I got this AMX panel that I put in a Ronald McDonald house for a year and I let them have it for, for sort of uh, exposure. And then now I have it back. Now I have no idea what I'm going to do with this. And it was like a $12,000 cost, huge 12 inch, you know, those big beast touch panels. And um, one of the other guys at the table who was from, you know, opposite part of the country was like, well, 
I'll, or the guy said, I'd be happy to get two grand for it now. And the other guy said, hey, I'll, uh, I'll buy it for two grand. I could use it on this. He had some kind of use for it. And so uh, that's when we were like, you know, there really should be a place for dealers to be able to buy and sell this excess inventory. Cause you can't necessarily, it breaks vendor agreements to just list it on eBay. Um, and so there should be a way for dealers to communicate with each other and, and uh, buy and sell. And so I don't know, maybe a year or so later, um, I worked with a web developer buddy of mine and I spec'd it out and, and they built it and I launched uh, InventShare sort of just on the side to help dealers um, list and, and sell excess inventory that was sitting on their shelves, tying up cash. If I'm remembering th this was, uh, fairly controversial. Um, a little bit. I got, uh, you know, I got calls, several manufacturers called us and said, Hey, we got B stock inventory that we don't, we can't do anything with it. So can you help us sell that? And wow. I wasn't, I wasn't really ready for that. Um, it wasn't really built for that, but that was the direction we were headed. And, um, I had one or two vendors that didn't like it, but it was like, you know, do you want your dealers to stick with this? They're all selling sideways anyway. Um, and so give them a more formal way to do what they're already doing. Right. Put it on a platform that you can control. Right. And you can make sure that they're all dealers on here and that they're all authorized. And in fact, um, I had a setting and I think it was per brand where, um, if it was a lockdown brand, it could only be seen by other dealers who were of uh, that brand of that brand. So like okay. I put some, I put a few things, it was nothing like what portal had at the time actually, but, um, it was a few things like that to help sort of, uh, make it work for them. And, uh, but like, you know, dealers, I, I had a dealer that, you know, their customer dropped a Crestron remote that was out of production their, their daughter dropped it on the tile. It exploded into a million, maybe she threw it, who knows, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> broke into a million pieces. And the alternative to replace it or, or, you know, their only option to replace it was here's a new remote, but it's a brand new remote. We got to reprogram it into the system. It's going to cost, you know, two, $3,000, or we find this remote from another integrator and load the same control project in it. And it's 600 bucks. Um, and so I had stories like that all the time happening, uh, through, through InventShare. And so, um, I started to grow that sort of on my own on the side and I started to get more dealers and I met with all the buying groups and I got uh, buying group programs with three of the buying groups. InventShare became a vendor partner of three of the buying groups. Yes. And one of them was even subsidizing the cost for dealers. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so that was just me on nights and weekends, calling them up and doing deals and, and setting stuff up for guys while I was with uh, Jetson. So, wow. Um, but it got to the point where it was sort of, you know, I had my own time and money invested in this platform. It was growing. I had manufacturers calling me um, to list these B stock products. But it wasn't enough revenue moving for you to justify Correct. quitting your job. Correct. It, yeah, that's right. And so the entrepreneur dilemma of when to go all in. That's right. That's right. So, um, I, I remember I saw, I met Kirk at Cedia. Um, and this would have been, I think 2013. And so, um, I met him that Cedia and that was their first Cedia with an actual booth. It was supply stream at the time. And it was this catalog of industry parts and an ordering tool. Um, which was sort of a lot like what I had, this catalog of industry parts and a way to place orders. It was just, they were ordering from other dealers. And so we met and he showed me supply stream. I thought it was pretty cool and got his contact information. And then um, I started doing buying group shows that spring and having to take time off to grow it. And I was getting a lot of interest from people, um, including a couple acquisition offers. <laughs> Um, as part of like distributor companies and some other stuff like that. And so I realized that I was sort of at a crossroads where I had to either jump off and move in this direction or just give it all up and, and kind of let it go and focus on Jetson because it was just getting too big for me to do both. And so um, I uh, called up Kirk and uh, we ended up talking for over an hour just about 
you know, the, our vision for the industry and uh, the direction that we were both going and our philosophies really aligned um, on just about everything. And so I ended up going to buying group show in Las Vegas, Kirk flew in to meet with me. And by the end of 24 hours, he was like, why don't I just acquire InventShare? You can come work for me and we'll do this thing together. And so I was like, let's do it. So I had to say goodbye to flying to um, the French Alps and uh, Iceland and Bahamas. Yeah, but we you get more on. quality FaceTime with your family, <laughs> which right. which is priceless. That's right. So, um, so yeah. At least I that's what up... you keep telling yourself. <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so, yeah, that's when I started with uh, Supply Stream. It has been a pretty crazy uh, time with uh, with supply stream. So, which is now portal. Um, and so what, why the, why the name change? Why did, when, when did that happen? And why did that happen? That happened in, I think it was 2016. And, you know, when we started, it was supply stream because um, it was where you went, where there was a stream of your supply of products, right? So, all of these products were in one place. And so when you think about getting supplied products, you would go to this one web catalog. And what ended up happening was as we got investor funding built around this marketplace idea and manufacturers starting calling us and saying, hey, I would, instead of spending half a million or a million dollars on a website or on a web portal, um, can we just send our dealers to you guys and, and have them send their orders through your platform? And we'll use that as our, as our web uh, portal. So we were getting a lot of calls from manufacturers that wanted to do that. And dealers started calling, referring to us as the portal. And the way we saw it was there's a lot of different manufacturer portals that are out there. Some are okay. Snap was, was sort of notoriously the best in the industry. Uh, but even they would probably admit that they were a step below what Amazon had. And so, um, you know, and there were a lot of really crappy ones that said, Hey, look at my portal. And it was a bunch of price sheet PDFs that were loaded into a behind a dealer login. And, um, we said, all right, well, everybody's calling us the portal. Let's just adopt that name. It makes sense. And we're not, you know, supply stream is sort of confusing, uh, in terms of the branding and, and what it meant. And so that's when, uh, that's when we rebranded, we rebranded that CDM. To portal now you guys uh, and by, by the, the way, way I, oracle owned portal.com and wanted like a hundred plus grand for it so that's how we ended up with portal.io ah <laughs> uh, okay I, well i was gonna actually ask you a branding question because at cedia and uh man do we all miss shows or events i know yeah. we do here at one firefly but you guys had this brilliant iconic image at every event with these orange pants yeah. And orange, I actually have a, a little Lego here. I don't have yours, but I have Spider-Man here. But oh, you nice. guys would give out uh, the little orange panted Lego men. I have uh, one. You're, you're going to go get it, aren't you? <laughs> I got Folks, it's, I got it's worth Lego it. You man. got it? Oh, there he is. The orange panted uh, Lego man. So where, where did the orange theme and just uh, kind of that sense of to brand around the color orange? Because it, it's frankly, pretty brilliant. So that was all Kirk. Um, they were supply stream was orange before I came on board. And so, you know, that was Kirk, the designer Kirk putting all of that together before me. So I don't know the full story. You'll have to have him on the show and ask him I have to have him on the show with orange. That first CDO though, their whole team had orange pants. Um, and they were sort of, uh, you know, they were, weren't quite the same color orange that they are now, but that's when it all started. So I came in. Um, so I was at CDA number two where they had a booth. And so we had orange pants and it just sort of grew from there. I think it was on our third or fourth CDA where we started doing the Lego men with, with orange pants because it had taken on such a life of its own. I remember um, I was doing a CDA, um, one of the classes, I was doing a round table on international project management. And I walked into the um, instructor area in my super bright orange pants. And I think Joe Whitaker was sitting there and somebody else. And they just started making fun of me because of my 
bright orange pants and you know they i just had to stand there and take it and there was nothing i could say and meanwhile he's marketing for you because he's just talking about your pants and talking not only about that company. but amanda wildman walked in and uh and she goes whoa nice pants and they were just <laughs> like <laughs> i didn't even have to say anything that shut him up <laughs> that's funny and uh, i see wim uh from spain just posted uh or just made a comment he says uh, so cool to hear the story leading up to supply stream portal thanks for that josh and ron <laughs> Our, yeah there it is good to see you wim you uh where is it wim says uh we did orange pants and it took off from there great line josh that's I, right. I think that's going to be the quote on our artwork for this podcast is you gotta stephanie capture that we did orange pants and it took off from there so uh, Portal has had some uh, amazing industry innovations, and uh, you've also tried to innovate, innovate around payment models, and some of it's worked and some of it hasn't worked. Where are you guys at right now? I know you guys made some, so you guys p pivoted. I want to say it was in 19, but it might have been in 2018. Can you kind of take us through a little bit of that? Like, what did you do, and then what ultimately led you uh, to change the model and has that model worked out? Yeah. So we monetized around the marketplace model. And remember I said that all those manufacturers were calling us and wanting to do their portals. That's when we realized, Hey, we could keep this system or make this system at the time. We can make this system free for dealers, um, with our proposal tool and subsidize that with revenue from manufacturers on the marketplace side. Um, and for distributors to participate as well. And so that's what we um, raised funds off of. And that's what we set out to do. Um, it didn't grow at the rate we needed it to. I think there were a number of factors. We're actually um, working on telling more of that story soon. Um, but in, a, in an industry like ours that's so controlled and where the buying behavior is not what consumer buying behavior is. And when there are sort of intangibles um, that dictate dealer buying behavior. Like my sales rep is, you know, he hooks me up and does systems design for all of my projects. So I'm always buying from this vendor. I'm getting free benefit. So I'm going to keep moving my flow through him versus moving it over here, even if I buy it for a little bit less. Or whatever. Sure. And and not even that, like we, we even had where they could still order from them and even send the order to that vendor. But um, the dealer wanted to call them up and talk to them. And and um, there was, you know, it was just um, there were too many roadblocks in terms of uh, taking that. Look, somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to come in and make um, and consolidate the industry and make purchasing a lot easier than it is now. And uh, eventually it's going to be probably Amazon, um, but it won't be Portal. Um, we learned it the hard way, right? We had the the. $10 million case study. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it just, there were a number of factors. It wasn't just that factor. It was, uh, cause those relationships we actually were working on trying to keep, um, because we knew dealers valued those. There were, there were a lot of other things that, that, uh, made it not work. So, um, that's when we sort of sat down with our investors and said, look, the, the marketplace isn't growing at the rate we need it to, um, to cover our operational costs. And uh, we decided that the most popular part of our site was the proposal tool. Um, it's what dealers got most excited about. When we, when we showed it to dealers, they would get excited. The ones who were using it were excited. And we realized that you know, it was time to pivot and turn into a real company, generate real revenue. And um, so we did that in May of, of um, 2019. So it's been about 18 months. And we told dealers, look, if, if you love it the way you said you do, then uh, you'll have to support it. And so they did. And by the end of the third quarter, 2019, um, we broke even and uh, we've been growing steadily even through the pandemic since then. So um, did, did you pop a bottle of champagne on that day that you broke even? Um, we do, well, as you know, running a business and breaking even is, oh, is when you haven't like, been breaking even and then you do, that is a day worth celebrating. Right, right. There's been a couple of days that, that we've been celebrating, um, big, big milestones as a company. So, um, it's definitely a better time. 
Uh, we were in growth phase before and just scaling back. That was a big challenge for us was seeing, you know, if our support would suffer um, and, you know, scaling back is hard. That. It's scary. It's, right. I mean, I, I've had to do that once or twice through my career here at, at one firefly and it's, it's never fun. It's terribly stressful. Yep. You lose sleep. You know, it's, it's very, yeah. very, and I'm very not, scary. I'm not one to lose sleep, but I lost some sleep in 2019. That's for you sure. I lost some sleep in 2019. So, uh, but it's good. We turned things around. What, what are the, what does the economic model look like today? Uh, so like, we're hundred percent. What, 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 well, what does a dealer, what does a dealer pay to be a part of your, your club? Right. So we have a monthly subscription fee. And uh, we have an entry level for really small dealers um, that starts at 40 bucks a month with a, with a proposal cap. Um, really, most people find themselves paying around 90 bucks for a single user license, uh, and they get pretty much all the features of, of Portal in that one. Um, and then there's more expensive plans based on number of, of users. So that's the price range. I tell dealers, 89 bucks, it's a, uh, it's a billable hour a month. That's right? no so brainer. Most dealers tell me sort of anecdotally, they, they can build proposals in 25% of the time. And it's, we've never really been able to test that, but consistently that's what people tell me. I can build proposals in 25% of the time. So if you're building proposals in 25% of the time, I think you can find that $89 one billable hour um, to pay for, to pay for the platform. Um, so in simplest terms, help me understand. And for those that are listening, how do you accommodate and I know a lot of these people listening are, are portal veterans. They're like, Ron, you're asking such a dumb question, <laughs> but how does the dealer uh, find their pricing? Cause these guys are all in different markets. They are yeah. perhaps buying at different levels. They're doing different amounts of volume. Maybe they have different rebate programs. I mean, all, all of that customization, is that accounted for in the platform? Yeah. So when we, first built portal. And I say we, but I'm talking about when like Kirk launched this and met in the basement of, of his developer's house to, to initially spec it. They took two years to build the platform that would adjust all of the industry data and create the database structures that would allow them to present all the way down to a single price on a single product from a single vet, um, from a single vendor to each dealer account. So that was built originally before they ever even showed up to their first CD, which I think was 2012 when um, Kirk and Kyle walked around with iPads and just showed people and walked into booths and showed people. So that was a really sort of critical piece because we knew if we didn't solve that first, there would be nothing because it's a, it's an important part of a protected industry is to have those pricing channels and to keep them protected from other dealers. So building that was sort of a foundation of, of our catalog. And one of the reasons that portal is so easy for dealers is because the catalog data is there. So we have a data team that um, runs all of those data feeds and make sure that that data comes in there for dealers so that dealers don't have to do it. When you start with QuickBooks as a dealer, you've got to enter all your product information. And so any proposal tool is more painful, the less product data that's in it. Um, just by nature. And so um, that's sort of a key um, value proposition for our platform is that when a dealer logs in, they don't even have to set up who their vendors are and their pricing. They can get in and build a complete proposal um, with the retail value on products um, in 15 minutes, having never used the site. And that, that's really what we were all about design and easy to use and, and get in and create a beautiful proposal with no training. You guys, I'm imagining, now you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you guys have a super interesting lens into almost as a leading indicator of industry activity. And I'm going to put you in the same category probably as a, like a D-Tools in this respect and yeah. SRS and some of these other bid magic and these other guys. But because you... You probably saw the impact of COVID in March before the manufacturers did, before everyone else did. And, and you may have seen this. I mean, every integrator in the in North America anyway is busy as they can be right now. And you, I bet you saw that before everyone else knew that we were coming back to life. 
Like, what was that like? Is that the case? And what, what are you guys able to see from your vantage point? Um, it is. So we, um, we monitor our overall proposal activity just for one of the health data points of our, of our business. So um, we've been monitoring for years and, and watching uh, the total accepted uh, proposal volume in general. And so um, it's also, we're in a unique channel where the integrator sits between the consumer and the manufacturer. And a lot of times there's a distributor in there as well. And so what that does is it limits what a manufacturer can see in terms of pipeline, right? So Amazon has it figured out for the consumer. If, if Amazon signs up a new vendor, they'll know how many units of that product that they'll sell in the next 30 days down to you know, plus or minus 3% or something like that. So um, we don't have that in the channel. So when a manufacturer predicts how much product they're going to need for next quarter, they're really doing historical analysis. And, and certainly they can't predict the pandemic in most cases. And so, um, so that's sort of data that is helpful to the industry in general, you know? Um, and so we were sort of monitoring that on our own through March. And of course, um, we saw some crazy data and then we saw, you know, we saw the pandemic hit and the see it flatline. We did see it flat. Now it never completely flatlined, which we were a little surprised about. Um, the one thing that we saw was uh, in that sort of third week of March, uh, we hit a proposal. Um, we were we were ramping in in February, and then in March we had a pretty big spike. And uh, I th we believe what happened was as the integrators were getting ready to shut down, they tried to close as many of their projects as they could ah. um, going into the shutdown. And so we saw that spike hit, and then um, and then it dipped a little bit, but it did not go to zero. So there were guys out there that were working. Um, and of course, the the pandemic and the shutdowns were sort of a wave across the state. So it didn't affect all markets the same way. So I think that's probably that. But, um, you know, within about four to six weeks, we started to see that proposal volume growing. Um, and, and within about eight weeks, it had hit um, higher than we had ever seen. And so the guys... Wait, were, what month was that? Uh, that was June, I believe. June, your yeah. highest peak. Accepted proposals, yeah. Yep. You've ever seen. Yeah. How, how was the whole, the totality of the, was that like a, a, a bump and then a drop throughout the summer? Or did it no, stay plateaued? It, it was, it was climbing. We were seeing, uh, we, we look at it weekly. So like weekly overall accepted proposals and it's not just proposals built, right? Cause we want to know what's, what's actually landing. What's, what's converting what's sold. Right. Right. And so, um, that number was week to week the highest we had seen and it continued to grow through July. Um, I think it's flatlined a little bit, um, but it was, it didn't go down. Do you guys, I, I, you mentioned, and, and by the way, I would, I would call manufacturers just to check in. And we were sort of on the lead leading edge of that growth saying, Hey, I, I'm seeing things start to rebound. And they were, they were just getting those orders in. They were saying, yes. Yeah, so well, we're that intersection is what I was curious about. And I'm only going to, I'm going to juxtapose this. You know, I was sitting in a buying group event. Uh, uh, maybe I want to say maybe it was an as own event. Maybe it was a year or two ago. And and Randy Stearns from DTools, CEO of DTools, was talking about uh, the future of DTools Cloud and the um, ability to have data and data that would potentially be valuable or interesting to manufacturers mm -hmm. as a leading indicator for manufacturing and production. Do you guys at Portal have relationships with manufacturers or do you feed that data to them? Or is there some relate? I mean, I would imagine they'd want that data. My goodness, it's got to be some of the best data in our industry or is it that is kept proprietary or how do yeah, you think so about that different manufacturers value that data differently some okay you could give that data to and they would it, it would change they could save you know they could shorten their cash conversion cycle from 30 days to 29 and save a million dollars a day and so uh, other ones wouldn't know what to do with it they um, don't have the internal ability to process it or right. do something with it. So we we provide some of that data, but only in aggregate because the dealer's privacy is is our number one concern. So we don't want to provide them. The last thing that we would want is um, 
aside from it not being the right thing to do, <laughs> the last thing that we want is for a vendor to start calling a dealer and saying, hey, you didn't quote my speakers on this project or something ridiculous like that. So um, we protect dealer privacy and we provide some of that data um, in aggregate, aggregate. So we do have an advertising um, piece of our catalog and um, that advertising piece, those, the vendors who do advertise, uh, some distributors and some direct manufacturers um, get some aggregate reports, um, but it's only their products and it's only in aggregate on, on proposals. So they can track sort of how they're doing on a monthly basis. So we don't really release uh, certainly no individual dealer data. That's, that's all. How, how are you feeling? Uh, I, I realized I'm looking at my notes that I've gone through like, you know, three or four of my 15 topics. I want, I would I do this every week. It's terrible. I don't know why people keep watching me. Cause they're like, Ron, when are you going to get to all the other stuff? Um, what, what are you, how are you feeling? We as an industry are going to finish here in 2020. Um, you know, man, we're, we're, teetering right on the edge um is this still. a good edge or a bad edge no i mean <laughs> what know, edge is as this? a whole as a as a you know as a nation we're sort of teetering right on the edge where it's um you know we're, we're gonna go into a recession here i think that that's pretty much a foregone conclusion and so how that affects the one thing that i remember we were discussing at the very beginning of, of when things were starting to lock down was we, we were thinking that it was going to feel a lot like it did after nine 11, where um, customers were sort of hunkering down in their homes and starting to, when they were ready to spend money, they were spending it on their homes, right. To get, get the kids out of the freaking living room and out of my office and somewhere in a, in a basement theater where I can't hear them. And um, I want to enjoy my, my pool more this summer because I'm at home all the time. And so we did see that to start to happen. I think the dealers that um, sort of figured out how to shift their model to work f during the, the pandemic and capitalize on the opportunities that were there, like IT services and home office upgrades um, and uh, around networking. And a lot of those guys have really come out strong on the other end of this. And so I think that they'll continue to, to see some solid growth. Um, I think at some point though, we'll hit, hit a recession and, and that'll affect the, the wallets and the pocketbooks of, of the consumers. But so far, as far as I can tell the, uh, people with money are still spending money. I was going to say, does the recession, um, uh, and I, I agree on the, the concept of a recession seems probable, not guaranteed, but probable, um, there's also, you know, the data and, and I would just say the proof for us in this industry that although many in society have been harmed and, uh, and certainly we should all do what we can do to help them. The, the customer, the consumer that our industry primarily or historically has served, uh, you know, let's call it one, you know, 1% 1 of wealth in society, th those folks, they're generally doing pretty well this year in 2020. And I think a lot of the, you know, the articles I've read in the economist and Forbes and whatnot talk about them in most cases, those people leaving 2020 with more wealth than they entered into 2020. And that's just wealth disparity and politics and all sorts of other topics we won't go into here that cause that. So the, I guess the, the question and, and you don't, ha you don't have to have an answer. It's more of a high level question. I'm curious if you have opinions if there's a recession, do, do we think it affects our industry and this consumer uh, or do they keep think, spending? I definitely think it, it, it affects um, a percentage of our industry because not all of our industry sells to the 1%. Um, there's a lot of guys out there that are doing killer five to 10,000, $15,000 systems built on the backs of ring and Sonos and, systems that work really well for mid-market consumers. And uh, I know a lot of dealers who are doing that business. And so I think a recession absolutely would affect a large percentage of our industry. There are some guys that they won't, they won't see it at all. Their average job is 250 to $500,000 and up. And uh, those consumers are probably still spending. Um, but certainly I think the industry will feel it on some level. So, uh, I, I just got permission here. Kirk, uh, your CEO just messaged me. Uh, appreciate that, Kirk. Uh, 
Yeah, I see he just put a comment here in the chat stream. He says, you've got mail. So he sent me the chart. Uh, this chart is... Uh, oh, nice. a, so he sent me a, a 12... Let's see. It looks like it runs February to the present. Yeah. And oh my God, it, there was... Uh, this is volume. I'm assuming this, the, the chart is not titled and it's not for distribution, so I'm not going to show it, but I'm going to tell everyone what I'm seeing. I, I see it looks like a low in proposal. I, I don't know if these are created proposals or closed proposals. They are uh, closed accepted proposals. Closed accepted proposals. Yeah. So I, I see the chart bottoms in May. Yep. And it's pretty much, I mean, it is greater than a 45 degree line up to the present. It is greater than 45 degrees. I mean, it is a a rocket ship up in terms of closed proposals. So it hasn't quite flatlined, like I said, but um, as far as we were, I don't I don't look at it every day, but it was we saw it come out, and it was those numbers are higher than we've had in all of 2019. So June was the highest, yeah, and then July was the highest, and then August was the highest, yeah, and now right. September is the highest. <laughs> That's uh, that's that's amazing news yep. for our for our industry. And so, uh, Josh, we are we're coming to our end of our our time here today. But you know, what has you and your team most excited as you look forward for Portal? Yeah. So we're all. I think I mentioned this before we we uh, went live. But for me, I'm all about creating value. And so our team is excited about staying focused on building value for dealers around that proposal process and about running their business and, and winning those jobs and getting paid. And so, um, you know, we're just continuing to plug away based on identifying and creating value for dealers. Um, and I, you know, I extend that to all parts of, of my life personally, is just how, how am I adding value um, to the people around me uh, and to the businesses that I interact with. So. Do you see uh portal you I I know you and Kirk well enough to know that you guys can't help but innovate. And uh I'm assuming you have all sorts of secrets up your sleeve. So is there anything you're allowed to say? You want to break news here or just your the world needs to stay tuned for the cool stuff that you guys have coming? Um I can't I can't break any news here. Um some of our projects are very long term. Um but I will say we're in the middle of a really cool project where we're documenting dealer process, not just around proposals, but around every piece of their business. And um, we're going to share that with the industry. So when it's time to figure out how to grow from a three-man shop to a nine-man shop, there's one place that they can go to, to see what everybody else uh, is doing and what they're using and how they run their business. So that's a really cool project that we're right in the middle of. Um, and then there's some other ones just around making, even though we're really easy to build proposals to making that even easier. Um, eventually I, I would love to see, you know, my, my perfect world for proposals. And this isn't something that's going to happen next year, or maybe even in five, but certainly within the next 10 years, I think dealers will be able to walk into a job, um, into a, into a customer's house. Um, plug in the rooms, hit a button and have a 100% uh, accurate proposal generated right away and hit another button and have it delivered on an automated vehicle labeled by room uh, within an hour. Um, I think eventually I would love to see uh, that kind of, and I think the infrastructure is out there and the technology is coming. And so um, I'd love to be on the forefront of that kind of uh experience in the industry. Well, I think you and Kirk and team are absolutely on the forefront of, of making that happen. And uh, certainly for all of our, our viewers, I want to thank you guys for watching and, and uh, for those listening on podcasts for listening. Uh, Josh, for those that want to get in touch with you directly, what would be the, the best forms of communication? Uh, I love email. Email is the best for me. So it's just Josh, J-O-S-H at portal.io. Josh at portal.io. I'm going to attempt to put this on the screen. Tell me if I got it right. You got it right. There it is. 
Awesome. Do you do any of the socials? Or are you are you an actor, active Twitterer? -er -er? I'm I'm not. Uh, Neither I, am I. So I, I'm not saying that that's good or bad. But some I don't are. think I have enough to tell people that they care to hear to get on Twitter. Um, I never. I'm not Instagram either. I'm mostly on Facebook, so uh, people can find me on Facebook. Um, at some point, I'll probably pick up Instagram or Twitter. You got to figure out the gram, man. The gram's where it's at. There's so many. There's so many out there. And uh, yeah, so Twitter, I don't know. You know, I try to follow what the young kids are following, and they're all over Twitter, so... I was gonna say, if you're if you're following what the young kids are doing, then you're gonna be tit talking. Oh, and right. you're, you're gonna have the TikToks, uh, you know, portal dances uh, flowing in orange. Actually, you know what? That'd be really cool marketing. Yeah, maybe Get you and Kirk and team in the orange pants doing some TikTok dances. Dude, hey, you heard it here first, folks. All right, the maybe future we'll of portal marketing on TikTok. There you go, Josh. It was a pleasure to have you on, my friend. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Ron. I had a, I had a good time talking with you. Awesome. All right, guys. So there you have it. Uh, this was show. Uh, what was this? This was show 136 automation unplugged the one and only Josh Willits president at portal. Uh, thank you all for watching and listening and commenting. And uh, if you guys have not already, and I do look at these numbers every week, if you have not already subscribed to the podcast, uh, I actually, uh, before we went live, uh, Josh admitted he had not subscribed. So he has subscribed now. And uh, we went and found the podcast app on his phone. And uh, I even gave him my little tick uh, tip, which is to find time in your weekly schedule to go for a nice walk. And it's good for your health and it's good to consume episodes of Automation Unplugged. Why not? Or or history or art or economics, whatever your jam is. All of that stuff is out there in the, the podcast landscape. And uh, here's how to contact us. You can visit us on our website, onefirefly.com. There's our phone number. And until next week, I bid you adieu. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>